So helpful. All right, so we are continuing on, as most of you probably know, not all maybe, in the book of Hebrews. We're in the Hall of Faith. Such a favorite chapter if you love Hebrews. Hall of Faith is helping us to know and understand who God is pointing out and saying, this is someone who is set up as a, we sang about it this morning, someone who is a hero of the hall of faith. God says, I want the whole world to know forever that this person lived in a way that I exalt in the sense that they have chosen faith over all other options that they have. And so we've looked at a number of them, including, we even included ourselves in that list right off the top, right? Those who believe in God's creative work, he says there's a place reserved for us in heaven. Talked about Abel offering the more excellent sacrifice because it was done by faith. Talked about Enoch who walked with God for 300 years and God took him because he was so pleased with his faith. And of course, we looked at Noah last week. Uh, Noah's probably not a surprise, he's just in the hall of faith. The first few probably are. They're not names you would normally pick out. But Noah built an ark. We, we are all here descendants because Noah faithfully obeyed God, faithfully built the craft, the, the ark according to God's instructions, and the whole world, including the whole animal kingdom of land-breathing, air-breathing, or land-dwelling, air-breathing animals, were all here because Noah was faithful. The one that should never surprise us is that if we know anything about the Bible, know anything about the characters in the Bible, the, the, those who the, is centered around the story of, Abraham is certainly someone you would say, yeah, Abraham's in the hall of faith. For one, we, both we as Christians and the Israelites, the Jews of old or even through today, would call Abraham the father of faith. Abraham has got a faith that God truly rewarded and called all people to emulate or to look towards the faith of Abraham and come under his headship as the father of faith. And so we have this role of Abraham as our father of faith. We'll, we'll show you a couple of scriptures where that comes from in a moment. But for now, well, actually a couple things, uh, not for most of you. Roy, I'm going to have you close this out. And Emily, um, there's a few verses I didn't include that I'm going to, in Hebrews 8, or Hebrews 11, I'm going to show you in a few minutes. So I think thir- uh 10 through 13 or something. All right. Sorry. So let's read the first section of Hebrews now, um, 8 through 12, and look at that. So this is all about Abraham. He's actually going to be in two parts, Abraham's story, and there's a super important aspect to the second half of the account of Abraham and Hebrews we're going to look at. But this is the first part, Abraham getting started on his journey of faith. So Hebrews 11, 8, on your screens, in your devices, on your Bibles that you have, it says this. Actually, I want to read it out of the Scriptures. So Hebrews eleven eight. There we go. It says this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place that which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of that same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many of the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore." So this gets us started. Let's talk about Abraham. One of the things that, we, again, we want to talk about, he's called the father of faith. But what we see here, somewhat of a showstopper, is the very first verse, by faith Abraham obeyed. That's countercultural. That's counter-Christian culture today, that obedience and faith have any relationship at all. But it's a biblical view. Do not hear me ever say that you work for your salvation or that obedience earns salvation. That's the wrong side of the coin. What we see is every time we put faith in God, it produces in us a desire to do His will. We call Him Lord, and so we obey Him. What's the point in calling Him Lord if we don't do what He says? That's what Jesus himself said. He calls us, if we're going to call him Lord, then we're called to obey him. 
And so much of the church and so much of the culture is all about, well, I can get saved by faith, but I don't have to do anything with it. Have you read James? Have you heard what James has to say about those who claim to have faith and they produce no fruit? They do nothing for God's kingdom? Abraham is the father of faith. If we're going to follow in someone's faith, let's follow what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? By faith, Abraham obeyed. And it's not an easy obedience. Don't think of Abraham as having an easy obedience. I'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk about just why we call him the father of faith. So he's frequently referred to as the father of faith. One of the places we can see that throughout the New Testament in terms of us as non-Jewish people, non-descendants genealogically of Abraham, how do we become under Abraham as the father of faith? Well, look at Galatians 3.7. It says, Therefore know that those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. God, the Holy Spirit, just stripped the need to have a genealogical or a bloodline relationship to Abraham to come under his fatherhood. We're called children or sons of Abraham when we express faith. Now, what kind of faith did he express? One that obeyed God's calling in his life. Abraham's the father of faith, and we follow him. I pulled this one out, you can see it on the screen here, from uh, Romans 4, and I, try, I could read a whole 11 verses, but I thought I would try to pull out the, the intent of Paul showing that Abraham is the father of faith. So, he says this, in Abra- and this is just the, the, the summation of this, Abraham our father, dot, 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 believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, dot, 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 that he might be the father of all who believe. Do you get the point? Right? You can read all the rest of the verses on your own. You get the point. Abraham is our father. He demonstrated what faith looks like. And when we follow in his footsteps, then he's the father of everyone who believes. Okay? Not our heavenly father, but the seed of Abraham's faith is with us and dwelling with us yet today. So we call him the father of faith. I think it's an appropriate title for him. Okay. Now, here's the point. When you think of Abraham, and you think about maybe Genesis chapter 12, where God calls Abraham, and it says he called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, he he later calls him out of Haran, where he moved to a little bit later in a little bit of lack of obedience there, but then he learned how to figure out obedience. And at age 75, God calls Abraham out of his dwelling place, out of his father's house, to go somewhere. Now, when you think about that, do you think Abraham is like, well... I've got no better options. My life here in Haran is, is not doing so well. I don't, you know, we're pretty destitute. I don't have any offspring. No, 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 no. Abraham was in a city named for his brother that he just inherited from his father. And it tells us in Genesis 14, a couple of chapters later, let me read this, Genesis 14. Now, 14, 14. Now, when Abraham heard that his brother was brother Lot, it's really his nephew. His brother was taken captive. He armed 318 trained servants who were born under his own house who went in pursuit as far as Dan. He actually go, takes on five kings and defeats them with people that were born under his own house. He had 318 people born under his own house. How many here have 318 employees? that you're responsible to feed on a daily basis. Abraham had 318 people born in his house, raised to adulthood, and he is caring, providing for them. They're they're his trained servants. And I'm sure they probably had wives. And if they had wives, I bet they had children, since these servants are being born under his house. So how destitute do you think Abraham was? He had everything... I, it reminds me of the rich young ruler, when the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do to, be in, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks him a few questions about the law and all that. Finally, he says, go and sell everything you have and follow me. And he went away sad because he had many possessions. What did Abraham do? Abraham got up, left 
his house, left his inheritance, left everything where he could have confidence that he would have a, a, a prosperous life behind him, and he gets up and he goes wherever God leads him. When the first moment, the first day he's walking, he has no idea where he's going, and he's never been there. He doesn't know what's there available for him. That is faith. He's walking in faith. He's obeying God's call in faith. So he had a huge household responsibilities. He had presumably quite a substantial amount of wealth. And what do you have when you go into a foreign land? Nothing of that is left except for whatever he can carry along with him. So Abraham obeyed, and it's not a simple, oh, well, you know, there's just pack up and go. You got a few, five things to pack up and you're ready to go. He had 318 men in his house that traveled right along with him. That's a lot of responsibility and a lot of faith, I think, to step up into that. And by faith, it says in Hebrews here, it says, by faith, he went to that land that God was going to show him and give him as an inheritance. Now, he goes, I don't need a new land as an inheritance, Lord. I already had it. You made me leave it. Why do I need to go to a new land to gain an inheritance when I already left a land that was perfectly suitable for me to live in for the rest of my days? God says, no, I'm going to give you this land to you and your descendants as an inheritance. But here's something, and this really struck me as I was preparing the message this week. Abraham dwelt in tents for the rest of his life, and he lived another hundred years. Abraham lived to 175. God called him out of Haran at age 75. He never acquired property to build on, so he never built a house. All he ever did was live in a tent for a hundred years. So here's a picture, right? Uh, here's some, somewhat of a period-appropriate house, certainly not Abraham's house, but some house that they have you know, used from archaeological finds over here on the bottom right. You know, you can live in that. Certainly he thought nothing better of it. There are no better houses in those days. And look what he was called to live in for a hundred years. hundred years he lived in a tent. And this struck me this week, thinking about that. There's, I think there's a, there is a significant symbolic relationship that's happening here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul, using the analogy of your, you and me living in flesh and blood here on the earth, he calls it a tent. 2 Corinthians 5.1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We have this, we're living in a tent. What does a tent seem to represent? Permanency or transience? Transience, right? You're not, that's not the permanent dwelling place. It's a tent. It's a temporary establishment or temporary dwelling place, never meant to have or show permanency. We live in this tent here. Well, let me go back. Let me go to verse 4. Same thing, 2 Corinthians 5, 4. We who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed or untented, but further clothed that morality, mortality sorry, may be swallowed up by this life. Paul's saying we desire to get rid of the, the temporariness of our tent and live in an eternal state where we will be with God in heaven. So let me ask you a question. How many plan to live more than 100 years on this planet? I mean, so that's your goal, your objective. I plan to live more than 100 years. Okay, got one. And that's fine. That's, that's great. But let me ask you, so if Abraham can live in a tent in the middle of the land of Canaan for 100 years and do it by faith, do you think that has any relationship to what God is calling you and I to do here today? We're called to live by faith in this tent for 100 years. What does he have for us when we're done? Something far better than a tent. God, I I don't believe that's an accident. I really don't. That we might assume that the maximum lifespan of most of us, not statistically not all, but most of us is probably less than 100 years. Abraham, the father of faith, dwelt in a tent in the land of promise, not having received the inheritance for a hundred years. What is God constantly calling us to, especially in the book of Hebrews? 
He's calling us to live by faith in this tent, this vessel that He's given us to inhabit for a little while, so that when we get to eternity, we have the faith that produces the inheritance that He has promised to us. Does that seem to make sense? Abraham didn't just dwell for a year, didn't just dwell for a decade. He dwelt for a hundred years in that tent by faith. And he had to believe... Now, in this culture, I don't know about everybody here, some of you really, really, really love your children and really want to make sure that you financially set them up for their life going forward. Some of you don't. That's okay. I mean, it's between you and God and what they're doing, right? But Abraham would have wanted to establish an inheritance of his own hands, his own working for his descendants. Give them land. Give them possessions. Let it be so that they could be successful and carry on his name and his, what he was, had built his career on going forward. Abraham's descendants, his son and his grandson, Isaac and Jacob, just to name a couple, never had a house either. They all lived in tents. God is calling Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to live in tents never having received these promises. So this is, not, this is not looking so good for those who want earthly rewards, who want earthly pleasures, who want this life to be, I serve God so I can get whatever He will give me in this life out of. The message of Scripture going all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 25 is Abraham lived and obeyed God by faith even though All of the world around him seemed to say, I don't see any evidence that your life is better now than when when you left Haran. Can you see that? Anybody who had an objective evaluation would say, you had had a, had a, a, a house, you had land, you had an inheritance, everything seemed to be going quite well for you in Haran. Why are you over here in Canaan? The people in Haran probably liked him. The people in Canaan, they weren't too pleased to have Abraham come into their place. I mean, with his 318 servants and all of that, they did not like him infiltrating into their land, you can imagine, especially if they heard it all, hey, God wants to give you our land as your inheritance. That doesn't seem to go over too well. Abraham was in foreign territory, not well received by the people he dwelt with or lived around, so he's lacking land, he's lacking a house, he's lacking relationship in the neighborhood that he lives in. Things are going great for Abraham, right? Did he change? Did he think about going somewhere else? Not at all, not not according to the Scriptures. But before we get to that, we also see this little diversion into Sarah. So a, a woman is in the hall of faith, praise God. We've got women and men in the hall of faith. Every one of us, male, female, can live according to God's faith that He's provided for us. And it says here that by faith, Sarah conceived and bore a son even in her old age. Even in that time frame, you know, where people prior to Abraham and Sarah were living 400, 600, 900 years, Sarah was 89 years old, And as far as we know, she never conceived. We know she never brought forth a son. So she never conceived in 89 years, however long she was married to Abraham. Okay, not the whole time. But 89 years, she's she's married to Abraham, and during this time, in 89 years, she's not conceived. But then God comes to her and Abraham and says, this time next year, you and Sarah will have a son. Sarah laughed. She's like... I know, I know what is not working. I know what's not possible. I know that Abraham have attempted and not succeeded to have a child over the years of our marriage. It's really been a cause of strife and contention because offspring are so important to the family unit. She laughed. And God calls her out on it. She tries to, you know, deceive her. You know, how do you you lie to God? You know, no, I didn't laugh. God said, no, but you did laugh. He knows. But that wasn't a rebuke. It was this sense of, can you imagine? I'm 89 years old. My womb is dead. And the Lord of the universe is saying, I'm going to have a son. (laughs) That's incredible. 
that that would happen to me. And a year later, she has a son. And what does she name him? Isaac. What does Isaac mean? Laughter. She she names her son laughter or joy for the fact that she knows it's a miracle that brought this child into existence. And she believed God. That's the only reason why God fulfilled that promise, because she was willing to believe it by faith. Because it says she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, she and Abraham have been living in Canaan now for like 16 years. They don't have land. I mentioned this before. They don't have land. They don't have a house. They don't have offspring yet. But she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him faithful. It's not like they, she said, well, if God doesn't give us land by this time next year, I'm done with this. Right? She judged him faithful. He made a promise, and she knows that it's completely beyond her control. But she knows God can and will fulfill his word, his promises. So she judged him faithful, and she followed him. And that produced in Sarah and Abraham, it says in the scriptures there, by faith Abraham reproductively, good as dead, had a son. And because they had a son, they now have offspring as innumerable as the stars of the sky or as the sand of the seashore. That's a lot. You and I, even though we may not have any bloodline relationship, genealogical relationship to Abraham, as we said, he's the father of faith. As Paul says, by faith, those who, are, uh, those who have faith are sons of Abraham. So he keeps adding both in actual descendancy and in faith descendancy, Abraham keeps adding more and more and more to his fatherhood. God changed his name to Abraham, the father of a multitude. God changed his name before he had a single offspring. He's a father of a multitude. And we see the evidence of that continuing on today. All right, so Emily, I'm going to read the next section here. Starting in verse 13 of Hebrews 11. I'm going to get to this next section. Talking about those of faith before him, specifically Abraham and Sarah, the writer here of Hebrews says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that place, that country from which they had come out, then they would have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared that city for them. There's a lot going on there. First off, it says, these all died in faith. We have to come to the grips and reality that the promises of God are in two categories. Some promises do, in fact, have earthly temporal significance and fulfillment. The substantial promises of God have an afterlife heavenly reward, a heavenly promise that He will fulfill. So, again, a summary of Abraham's life. He, ne- he died never having land of his own, even though he abandoned the land that he once had. He died without a home. He died with a couple of kids and a couple more grandkids. And God said, no, I'm going to give you offspring as innumerable as the stars of the sky and as the sand of the seashore. He died not having received the promises. But did he not receive promises? Or did God fulfill his promises to him in eternity? That's the message. That's the calling to understand. Our focus is not on the tent. It's not on the temporal. Our focus is on the eternal, the permanent, the place that God has built for them and for us. So death came before the true fulfillment of those promises. Now, if Abraham could have lived another 600 years, he would have seen his offspring start to first go through a whole lot of uh, 
pain and suffering in Egypt, being enslaved in Egypt, but then he would start to see them become a nation. He would start to see them become prominent and important, and he would start to see them inherit the land. But he didn't live 600 more years. He died. And the point that the writer of Hebrews is trying to drive home is that we can't focus on fulfillment here. We are grateful. We th- we're thankful. We are always hopeful that whatever God has planned for us, He will fulfill it. But the writer of Hebrews says, it is impossible for God to lie. The writer of Hebrews says that when God makes a promise, He always fulfills it. But if you and I measure it in human terms, we may not see the fulfillment. In fact, the most faithful among us are probably those called to end up never seeing a true fulfillment of that. Abraham was called to live by faith. Abraham obeyed and did, in fact, live by faith, as Scripture here attests to, having never received the promises. If that's a challenge to you, i got to tell you, you really want to dig into what Scripture says. Because Scripture repeatedly, consistently says, your inheritance is in in eternity. Your true inheritance is in eternal life. It's not here. I know, again, here we go, counterculture, counterchurch. You want want to come to a church that says, God will bless you. He'll fill your bank account. He'll heal you of every disease. He'll do all of these things for you. And he will, but not guaranteed unless it's in eternity. That's where the fulfillment truly comes in. So here, Abraham, it says, waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Let me ask you, is there a city in all of human history whose builder and maker is God? Going backwards, no. Going forwards? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a heavenly new Jerusalem coming down in glorious appearance, coming down out of heaven at the end of the age. Revelation talks about it. Jesus talks about that place. Okay? So he promised Abraham, I'm going to give you a city, and I'm going to be the builder of that city. I promise you, Abraham, your, your descendants will inherit this land, and Abraham never saw that fulfilled. Abraham never saw an innumerable number of descendants. He only saw a handful. Okay? But while they weren't received in this life, Abraham and Sarah knew This is the point. Knew that God would fulfill his promises. They didn't have to live in this earth to see it. They knew in their hearts. They knew in their spirits. They knew that they had confidence in a God who would love them and trust in him. And so they believed in his promises. But it says, those who are willingly of faith, they willingly confess that they are merely strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's what Abraham and Sarah did. They willingly confessed. Somebody walks up to them and says, hey, Abraham, what are you doing over here in the land of Canaan? Oh, I'm a stranger, and I'm a pilgrim. Uh, my, this is not my inheritance. This is not my, where I live. This is not my family. My family is in heaven. I'll get there someday. I'm just a stranger. I'm just a pilgrim wandering through. Do you view your life as a stranger and a pilgrim in this fleshly world? Or do you view some level of permanency here and you're not really concerned about the eternal? God's focus is on get focused on the eternal. Stop worrying about the temporary. Stop worrying about the things in this life. Start acting like a pilgrim. Start acting like a sojourner, a stranger among people who dislike us. It would be so easy. I bet we might, over time, have ten times the number of people in this church If I tickled your ears, if I tickled your ears, told you exactly what you came to church to hear, I could fill this place 10 times this month. I'm not worried about the numbers. I'm worried about the accuracy and the truth. I'm worried about speaking the word of God in truth. I'm not here to tickle ears. And the word of God says we need to consider ourselves to be strangers and pilgrims, focusing on the eternity, not on the temporal. So they openly declared they were looking and waiting for the city that God was going to prepare for them. And here's, the, here's a really important point. 
in that hundred years of Abraham's life, Sarah was not quite that long, but in that time that Abraham lived, certainly the Scripture says they would have had an opportunity to return and just give up. Did they ever have that conversation? Did, they, did Sarah ever wake up next to Abraham one day and say, this isn't working. If God wanted to give us land, why don't we have it? If God wanted to give us a multitude of descendants, why don't we have them? Did they ever do that? No. Scripture says no. They pressed forward. They always went on. They always said no. Because in that conversation, they could have said, yeah, you know what? Let's go back to Haran. I'll bet if we go back to Haran, our house might still be there. Our family and people who like us rather than people who hate us, we could dwell with them. We could just forget this whole thing happened. No. The hall of faith lauds the opportunities that are given to us in Abraham and says, no, a hundred years, no fulfillment of the promises, living in a tent, and Abraham is a, is a champion, a hero of the faith because he keeps on believing until he breathed his last breath. I want to do that. I want to keep the faith I want to keep on going in my faith, in my walk with Christ, until I breathe my last breath. Could happen today. Who knows when? Until I breathe my last breath, I want to walk in obedience. I want to walk in faith. And I want to demonstrate to God in my heart, in my speech, in my mind, that I believe His promises, that His promises will be fulfilled when He brings them to us. I can't bring them to myself. He brings them to us. Okay. So, Jesus, again, as I spoke of this in John 14, most of you probably know the passage pretty well. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare that place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also, and where I go, and you will know the way. That's Christ's promises to us. He has a place, He has a mansion, and He will bring it to us. For the last 2,000 years, I know of no human being who has seen the fulfillment of that on this earth. Do you still believe it? Do you believe the one who promised? Do you believe the one that He is worthy to be trusted in the promises that He makes, He has prepared a heavenly city for you and I, and He calls us to, like Abraham, like Noah, like Enoch, walk in faith and follow Him until we cease to exist in this temporal state. Okay, let's close out. Five, our four points, I think, are really significant for us to glean from this. So if you want some action steps, here they are. Shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you, step one in the call of the hall of faith to you and I this morning is to obey God. Wow, that's shocking, right? God calls us to obey Him. Got sin in your life? God can fix it. God, can, God has already paid the price for it. He wants to bring healing and restoration to you. Doesn't mean any one of us will stop sinning, but He wants us to obey Him even through the most challenging aspects of life. You heard about some of that with SRT. 50% of people have some type of sexually related trauma incident happen in their life. Does that drive you to Christ or away from Christ? Christ says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden with the burdens of this world. Does it drive us to Him or away from Him? Some people, it drives them away because they can't reconcile a good and loving God who wants them to endure in all things into eternal life. Obey Him. He's given up His Word. He says, my burdens are easy. My yoke is easy. My burdens are light. Get into Him. Follow Him. Number two, or letter B on the notes. Trust God more than you trust your own eyes or wisdom. Don't trust your heart. Heart is wicked, deceitfully wicked above all things. Jeremiah 17, right? Don't trust your heart. Don't trust your eyes. Don't trust your ears. 
Trust God. First, foremost, and always. Then submit your, what you see and what you hear and what your heart is saying to the authority of God's Word. Submit to the Word first. Don't submit to your own will. Don't submit to man or man's ideas. Have endurance in the faith. Third point, have endurance in the faith. We all stumble. We all trip up. We all have moments where it's, our faith was better this day than that day, some kind of thing. But the call of God is endurance, to walk with Him. There's a finish line in chapter 12 of Hebrews. He's going to talk about running the race with endurance all the way to the finish line. Endurance, run all the way through. If you stumble, get back up, let Christ dust you off, forgive you of your sins, and move forward. Keep progressing, keep enduring in the faith. And by faith, know with certainty, know with certainty that God will fulfill His promises. There's not a single promise that anyone has ever received from God that has not been perfectly fulfilled. Never. Maybe not in this life, but he, as Abraham received, received the promise in eternity. Know that. Obey him. Trust him. Follow him in endurance with him. And truly, in our hearts, believe that he is a God who can be trusted to keep his word. Right, come on up.